Good morning and welcome to Radio Ulster's Consumer Programme on your behalf. And yes, we're starting a little earlier than usual for the next few weeks as we have so many questions and so much to talk about around coronavirus. So make a note in your diary, which I imagine is probably pretty empty on your behalf, Saturday morning, 9.30 to 10.30. So time your daily walk or your bike ride so you don't miss the programme. And this morning the experts are with me, not physically, of course, at my dining room table, which is where I am, but in their own homes, but available if you have a question. James Jones of Experian, the credit reference agency, joins me from his home in Nottingham to talk about the impact all this is having on income or loss of income on your credit history, of course. Phil McGarry of Advice, Advice NI is with me to let you know what advice and help there is if you're struggling with debt, and many are. Tony Neat of Get Safe Online joins me from his home in Cardiff because, uh, you know, so many scams going around. I want to warn you about those, some very nasty ones, so make sure you stay tuned right up till 10.30. And the one good thing about all of this, and I've noticed it is, that most people are thinking of others and making grocery deliveries to family and neighbours and volunteering in the community and of course the health workers as we know did you go out and clap on Thursday? I did. They're doing the most wonderful job. So if you know of something good happening in your area, let me know because we'd like to share that with the wider community we don't want it to be all doom and gloom that's, now, that's all coming up between now and uh, 10 and after 10 we'll talk to Tony about how, how the fraudsters and scammers are using or abusing the situation by sending out COVID-19 scam emails and text and how to protect yourself and Jimmy Hughes of course he'll be answering your questions as well and we will have the answer to one of the most frequently asked questions I have ever heard. If my flight has been cancelled, am I entitled to a refund? And more importantly, how do I get it? I don't want a voucher. People keep telling me that. Richard Williams of the Consumer Council will be with me after 10 to get the definitive answer. So if you've got a question, do get in touch. You know the usual way. 030 30 80 55 55. Standard geographic charges from landlines and mobiles. Or text on 81771 and that, then you'll be charged at your standard message rate. But let's start. Well, it's debt and that's always a worry to everyone. The Department of Work and Pension released new figures this week showing 950,000 people, nearly a million have applied for universal credit in the past fortnight. Usually in two weeks it's, it's apparently about 100,000 and I gather the uh, officers say they're working flat out to get help support for people and I'm sure the independent advisors here in Northern Ireland are inundated too with calls. So on the line now is from Action NI's debt team specialist advisor Phil McGarry. Morning Phil. Good morning. And from Nottingham James Jones of the credit reference agency Experian. Morning to you James. Good morning. Are you there? You are there. Good morning. And tax expert Adrian Houston. You there too, Adrian? I am, Linda. Uh, isn't that just great? Let's start, if I may, Phil, with you. Obviously, advice and I deadlines must be buzzing. W what are you hearing? Well, obviously they are buzzing, and for all reasons, because we're covering everything at the moment. Um, we're covering all about the, with a helpline to do with the community virus. Um, the tax benefits, business debt, debt, you know, ordinary debt. And, um, but the main problems that we're finding, you know, um, as advisors, are all to do with, first of all, mortgages. You know, what help can they get if they can't afford to make their monthly repayments? Yes, that's a worry to everyone, isn't it? Yeah. Because that's... And the government, what we are advising is the government have announced that if you're affected by the coronavirus and struggle to pay your mortgage... Uh, you may be entitled to uh, get what's called a free three-month payment holiday. To do that, you will need to contact your mortgage lender directly, as each lender has varying terms and conditions regarding the payment holiday. Your lender, you know, will look at your individual circumstances, offer support on a case-by-case -case basis. And if a payment holiday is agreed, then it should not affect your credit rating, which payments will cover, I'm sure, later. Yes, James, that's a good point. Just pop in there, if you would. Uh, th this mortgage holiday and also uh, the, the banks are, are sort of making sure that you, you go into, the, into the, your, your overdraft, you won't get charged for that. How, how, how is that going to ultimately affect your, your credit rating? Well, of course, you know, many people will be concerned about the impact of the, um, of the pandemic on their finances, particularly if, uh, if it's affecting your income. Um, banks and lenders want to help, they want to support their customers. And um, we had good news this week um, where we announced a, a cross-industry 
agreement to help protect people's credit scores at this difficult time. And essentially what that means is if you agree to temporarily pause or reduce your payments to things like uh, mortgages, loans, credit cards, and so on, um, because of the impact of the pandemic, then there is now a new mechanism to help um, ensure um, that this doesn't result in arrears building up on your credit report. And that's important, of course, because um, missed payments are, you know, are bad news usually for, for credit scores. So, so this agreement should help minimise any impact on people's credit ratings. And we know that's a concern for many people. So what's happening, what the FCA has done uh, in, in their, their efforts to make sure that credit card companies, store cards, catalogue credit, all that kind of thing, they're, they're doing all they can to make sure it doesn't give you, I know you'll say there isn't a black mark, but you know what I mean on your credit rating. Well, that's right, of course. We, you know, we need to work, you know, together as an industry with the, with the regulators and with the providers to help um, help everyone, you know, sort of cope through this crisis and make sure that people come out of the other end, you know, with um, with a, 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 a an undamaged credit record as, as far as possible. Uh, lenders are, you know, trying to be flexible. Um, there's lots of forbearance on offer from banks and lenders, uh, but it's critical that you speak to them first to see what they can offer and also to see what's what's appropriate for your circumstances. Because as you say, there's been a lot of talk of these payment holidays, whether it relates to mortgages or other credit products, but it won't necessarily be the best option for everyone. There are other types of forbearance, such as you know reducing interest or increasing credit limits, which is why it's so important that people speak to their lenders and agree um, you know, the best action for them um, and get that agreement because simply cancelling payments, stopping direct debits, for example, without speaking to lenders first is really not a good idea because any unauthorised mispayments are likely to to damage your, your credit score, which obviously could impact your chances of getting credit in the future. And I'm sure we'll be talking about this in the future. So, Phil McGarry of Advice NI, it, it's not just the mortgage, of course, it's the rent, it's the car finance, it's all those payments that are going out regularly and they will go out bang on time, even if the money's not coming in. Yes, Linda, but I would like to uh, point out that you can only get a holiday payment on your mortgage if you're not in arrears and you're up to ah. date with your payments. It's, you know, so it's not going to be across the board. So, you know, and... You'd need to contact your lender to find out, you know, will you be able to, able to get one. Um, the best way we would say is to go onto their website to contact them because if you're able to get the payment um, holiday, you can get a form online that you can submit to them. And also to let people know that your interest will continue to accrue during this time. So all payments that have been deferred will have to be made up. So when applying for the holiday, um, it's important to ask your lender how much you'll have to pay back as the total amount of interest you pay over the term will increase. So that's, that's a very good point. It's not just yeah. free money. It's, yeah. it's just delaying things. Mm -hmm. And some people are, we're talking about switching maybe their, to their lenders, to their mortgage, to their lenders, other products. But if you haven't already done so, it's, you, you'll not get it done now while you're on a payment holiday. Linda, the other thing too, which is important, like mortgage is, you know, very paramount in people who have a mortgage, but a lot of people are renting at the moment. And yes. um, their concern is, what will happen if I don't pay my rent? Will I be evicted? The That's two a frightening main, scenario. Yeah, in social housing, the two main bodies are the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and the Housing Association. Now, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive will not be taking any legal action to evict tenants where there's financial hardship suffered by a result of the coronavirus. So if you have any problems with, if you're a housing executive tenant, get in touch with them as soon as possible. They'll talk to you and find out any options. They'll check if you're entitled to benefits or other help, you know, and um, so it's important. They've got a website, but you can maybe put that on. We'll you know, put the links up. We will indeed, the links Phil. Up, be fine. The other we thing will. is the Housing Association. Um, they're entirely different, you know, the Housing Association, because they build houses and they need to have money keep coming in. So, um, But they've given a commitment to treat 
all the rent issues with sensitivity and will support their tenants during this time. They're not planning at this time on introducing any rent suspension. So if you're a housing association tenant and you require assistance, it's important to get into contact with them. They have welfare officers and housing offers, and they again will assist their tenants with housing benefit, universal credit claims, etc., you know, and develop a repayment plan. Now, it's all about having to pay it back at the end, isn't it? I mean, we're getting is. breaks, we're getting holidays, but the bills are going to have to be paid at the end. And uh, James Jones of, of Experian, w- will there be a kind of a, a, a star put beside this period of time? Things were different. I mean, surely when it comes to the shove, to push to shove, that when you hear yourself in trouble like this and you you, you try to get a loan in a, maybe a year's time, will someone look at your credit history and say, oh, no, that was different then, that was coronavirus time? I mean, I think we're working hard to try to shield people um, and their credit scores from the impact of, of this crisis. We recognise it's a, you know incredibly difficult and challenging time for, for so many people, which is why I think this agreement's so important, um, where if you, you, you know, contact your providers and agree um, forbearance for, um, for an amount of time, then it should stop um, any arrears and so on um, building up on your on your credit report, which should min- minimise any impact on credit ratings. And one of the important aspects of this is that actually the payment holiday won't even be flagged on people's credit reports. Um, it will just look like um, you know you're making your regular payments for the duration of the payment holiday. Um, to all intents and purposes. So so we're working very hard to help people, you know, come out of this crisis in the best possible shape. Um, and we know, you know, that people are um, increasingly aware of of uh, the importance of having a good credit history. We've, you know, we've had, Linda, many conversations over the years around, uh, you know, why credit scores are important and the sorts of things you can do to build and maintain a good credit history. And we, you know, we want to help protect people at this difficult time. It is a difficult time for everyone. Let me bring uh, tax expert Adrian Houston in. Adrian, good morning to you. Morning, Linda. Now, we talked a couple of weeks ago uh, about the employment and self-employment support measures announced by the Chancellor. The Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme, a temporary scheme open to all UK employers for at least three months, starting from the 1st of March. We didn't have all the detail, did we then? Do we have it now? I think we probably do, yes. The detail detail is now available. Unfortunately, what's not available is the ability to actually get the money. But yes, the government has has published a lot of the detail and they've clarified some of the important things such as uh, people running small one-person limited companies who were worried that they weren't covered at all and we've found that they are covered. Yes, so that's at least a a little bit of clarity. Yes. what are people getting then? And more to the point, not getting. There, there's still people missing out, aren't there? Yes, well, the, the most important thing about this is that you must have been employed by the employer at the 28th of February. Now, bizarrely, uh, you, can, you can have left the work. Maybe you, you, you may have left on the 2nd of March because you thought work was drying up and you, you, you'd got yourself another job and then that other job has fallen through. And people in that situation are actually winners because the employer that they were previously with on the 20th of February may, they don't have to, but they may take that person back. So then, we have a couple of those, them. haven't we, Adrian? We have a few people have been emailing me saying, I've fallen between two stools, leaving one job and starting another. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it all depends on the timing. Um, if they left the other job on the 20th of February, they're not covered. It, this only applies to people who were in employment on the 20th of February. If after the 20th of February they left to get another job and that fell through and their empl- old employer is happy to take them back, they can take them back, furlough them, and then they'll be able to get the 80% uh, of their previous wages paid by the government. So the old employer, it doesn't cost them anything and they have their workers then sitting ready ready and available when uh, when the situation improves and they can open up the business again. Uh, but, but if you, you just do, happen you to have... leave, of course, you know, one job. 
Yeah, you, you, oh, but you, you have to you have to have left. You have to be in in employment on the twenty eighth of February, and uh, after that, if you've either left or been made redundant by that employer, they can still take you back. Um, but it's their decision whether they take you back. But they can take you back at no cost to themselves because they then furlough you and and get the government support. But it's, they're not obliged to. But at least you know they can if they if they want to. So you could approach your employer, and and hope that they 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 see. A way to, to help you out in that situation. I think there was a little bit of confusion as well when we talked before about limited companies with, with a director. Yes, the, the, the standard situation where you have a limited company where, where one man or woman gen generally runs it and uh, they do all their trading through that, um, it is normal practice in those situations that they take their money each at uh, the company each month in a combination of, of salary and dividends. They do that because it produces a small uh, saving in national insurance. So it was worry. The worry was that they wouldn't be covered at all under this scheme. But it has now been confirmed that they are covered, but they are only covered for the salary element of what they take out. So if they take out a thousand pounds a month as a salary, then the the government support of eighty percent of that will be available to the company so the company can furlough them so long as they they stop work they they can't keep on looking for business or doing work for for customers or clients if the company is able to furlough that director um, so that they're just sort of sitting at home doing nothing but what they legally must do then uh, then they can get the eighty percent support as well but only on the salary element of their package not any dividends Fair enough. Uh, there is the employee retention scheme, of course. There, there's a link that you uh, we put up on our website. I'll not try to read it out. Too many dashes and dots, but it, it, the employee retention scheme is there. And uh, going live by the end of April, is that right, Adrian? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, as regards links, we should introduce you to tinyurl.com because you can then shorten a link to a, a name you give it yourself. So it could be <laughs> OYB. March 2020, <laughs> for example, and you could put up the links like that. Yes, this is expected that the, the ability to for the employer to apply for this scheme will be live by the end of April. Now, we're all depressed that that's quite such a long time away. Maybe they'll get it through earlier. But in the meantime, the government line is that businesses should apply for one of these loans, which are government backed, and, uh, and then get the loan pay the employees their, their 80% or 100 if they want to, uh, and then when the government funding comes through, they can then repay the loan. And have we clarification of the self-employed, Adrian? Yes, that, that's, that, that's also quite, uh, quite a good scheme. It is quite generous, but you do have to have been self-employed during the 2018-19 year. So like the other schemes, there will be winners and losers, people who have closed their business the earlier this year or people who only opened their business in May of 2019. But if you were self-employed, at least for part of 2018-19, you're entitled to uh, this support and it will be based on 80% of your profits. If you've been long-term self-employed, it'll be 80% of the profits averaged over the past three years. And like the employee scheme, there's a maximum of 2,500 per month in support. And this will be taxable income when you get it so it's there to re recognize that your business has lost some money but ultimately down the line you will have to declare it on your tax return that's useful to know uh, just a quick question it's a complicated one but aren't, that, aren't they all complicated uh, m his person oh it's moira can i inquire if someone's employed in the republic of ireland but lives in northern ireland uh, can you get the furlough pay, uh, payment the employer registered obviously in the republic and the irish government is not supporting workers any clarity on that one adrian the the, the UK government scheme seems fairly clear. It says it's a temporary scheme open to all UK employers. So I would think that Moira is probably not going to benefit from that scheme and uh, so she will just have to uh, apply for universal credit and see what else the benefit system might get her. It's a very unfortunate situation for her. Phil, Phil, thanks, Adrian. Stay with us, by the way. If you've got a question for Adrian or any of the experts today, don't forget the phone lines are open. They're 30 30 80 55 55. Uh, tweet me, of course, 81771 or, or, or text me 81771 or tweet me at Consumer Linda. Phil McGarry of Advice and I. Um, Applying for universal credit, I mean, as we said at the start of the programme, a huge number of people are applying. How long does it take to get your first payment? 
Uh, Linda, I'm sorry, I'm not. Um, I don't have anything to do with the universal credit. That would be covered by. You're know, more in debt. <laughs> but I'm more but your, co- your your colleagues, of course, and advice and I can help with uh, that. But totally. but that is a, that is an option, isn't it, to apply for universal credit? Absolutely, yes. And and as again, they're working that out. Their telephone line details are there, and you know the um for where they can contact on their helpline. The helpline number oh eight oh eight. 802 0020 That's the coronavirus helpline. There are other different numbers for the debt helpline and everything else too. But I don't want to give out too many numbers because it confuses people. Uh, that number, I'm quite sure, will signpost you to the right place, won't it, Phil? Absolutely. And uh, the other numbers as well. Linda, can I yes. come in just here? You mentioned um, the Finance and Leasing Association, FLA. Um, yeah, just a wee quick thing, that really um, affects people who are on hire purchase, cars on hire purchase, or those leasing a car. And they are wondering, you know, what will happen to them if they miss their payments for their car be repossessed. And, you know, so what the FLA have said is there should be forbearance in that, that really what they should be doing with the client is trying to work for them to have the car, the car remains with the driver, than being repossessed. And again, uh, the client should contact their lender or finance company as quickly as possible. And they could maybe arrange for the contract to be extended, lower monthly payments or some other arrangement, you know. Yes, I think the important is to talk to somebody. Uh, James Jones of Experian, it, it won't look any different, will it, when, on, your, on your credit history when you realise that somebody either did or didn't speak to their employer. It'll just be a, a mark there that you missed a payment. So c- communication, I think, is the most important thing here. That's, that's right, Linda. You really don't want to find unauthorised missed payments building up on your, on your, your credit report because the, those are really bad news for credit scores but just building on what uh, phil was saying there I, I was on an industry call yesterday and anecdotal evidence suggests that um that car finance firms are being flexible um and th- there were lots of examples of people that had personally been offered um in some cases proactively and um, payment holidays to help them um you know sort of cope with the uh, the fallout of the of the pandemic and of course you know this is important because if if you are on one of these pcps for example um in, in many cases you're talking about quite a substantial amount of money every month um so it's important that uh, you know that we all do our bit and try to be proactive and where you know we might struggle to meet um monthly payments contact those providers at the earliest opportunity um, to, to help, um, you know, help us get through this crisis in the best possible shape. So many questions uh, for experts, and you may, of course, ring us on 030 30 80 55 55, text 81771, or email oyb at bbc.co.uk. Uh, for the moment, thank you both James and Phil, and Adrian Houston is staying through to the end of the programme. If you have a question for him on the employment scheme, self-employed, job retention scheme, all those things, 030 30 80 55 55. In fact, last week when we had a, a shorter programme, we got so many questions we just couldn't squeeze them in. So during the week we asked Jimmy Hughes if he could answer some of them for us and the first question was from Kate and she's not alone in this one asking about deposits on holidays that of course they're not going ahead now. Should she be refunded the deposit for the holiday which isn't going ahead because her travel agent apparently says no. The bottom line is she should be looking for a full and total refund. Now exactly who she'd be looking for it from is, is something of a mystery. The we, we, I don't know who the travel agent is. Sometimes the travel agent is actually the tour provider, in which case it would be the tour provider she's looking for. If she has a holiday and it's been issued to her by a travel agent in the United Kingdom, she will have a NAPTA coverage on it and she should be looking for a claim in relation to that. This is the one where the person paid uh, before the time for the deposit. Uh, I, right. I would be contacting a number of people. I would contact, first of all, the travel agent so we get a formal response from them, and I would contact the holiday provider. Might also have a right under the uh, credit card, depends on the circumstances. If, again, she dealt directly with the travel company, the, the credit card joint liability is almost bound to cover her. The, the bottom line on it is that you are entitled to get money back 
when a service has not been provided. The question is, who are you getting your money back from? And I would imagine it would have to be the travel agent, and you'd be looking there for at whatever format of insurance under the APTA scheme that exists, or indeed possibly if they took out travel insurance themselves to cover the holiday. And, and the, the question that we keep getting asked, Jimmy, and I've asked you before, but people are anxious about paying the balance of a holiday that looks unlikely to go ahead. Uh, you're thinking of the old long-established law that possession is nine-tenths of the law. And when you have the money in your pocket, it's in your pocket, it's not in somebody else's. And it is awfully difficult to walk into a place and hand over a substantial final payment, perhaps, uh, knowing full well that the chances of the holiday taking place are going to be remote in the extreme. However, if you have... Let's take a holiday that's well ahead. We have booked our holiday now. We've paid maybe a deposit of a couple of hundred pounds. The holiday is due to head off on the 1st of July and to somewhere exotic. And at the present time, we have no FCO, Financial and Commonwealth Office, uh, saying that you cannot go to that particular country. So to all intents and purposes, that holiday should be taking place. And how do you take, make sure that you're standing to your side of the holiday? You pay your deposit, which you've already done, and you've got to pay your, depo- your balance. And if you don't pay the balance, they will then say, well, that's evidence that you want to cancel the holiday. And we will then apply the rules on cancellation and they are not particularly helpful to you, you will find that you will lose a substantial sum of money. Now, if it so happened that when the holiday came round, the Financial and Commonwealth Office had changed their mind and had allowed you to go and travel and everything was A-OK, then you would be liable for the whole holiday. But if they haven't, your insurance clicks in and you're liable to get your money back in full. So Jimmy Hughes will be with us regularly throughout these difficult times. If you have a question, a consumer question, of course, uh, you can email, email us oyb at bbc.co.uk. Uh, and of course, you can leave your name on the listener line. We'll be delighted to hear your questions there at 9033 8314. And we'll uh, get an answer for you as well. And Adrian Houston, I think we'll be talking to you very regularly because it's all about money, really, isn't it, at the moment? And not so much money coming in, but the same amount going out. And at the end of the day, we're still going to have to to pay the bills. They're not going to disappear forever. Well, that's right, yes. Uh, the, the, the good thing, I suppose, out of this is that we're all getting much less opportunity to spend money, so if we can stay away from the online shopping, we're not, we're not able to get out and spend much money and go to restaurants and uh, go out to the pub for a drink, etc. So at least the outgoings are reduced somewhat, but all of us have these regular monthly figures that leave our bank accounts. And so it's really worrying for people to know if, they, if they're going to have the money coming in uh, to cover that. And thank goodness the government scheme for employees is so generous. Uh, I, I think if everyone was getting uh, 80% of their pay, uh, they wouldn't have too much to worry about because their, their expenditures probably dropped by 20% in the current circumstances. There's a question here about a B&B, a bed and breakfast, not getting rate relief and seems not to qualify for the grant for small businesses. Are they the, one other of the in-between two stools ones? I, I think they may be. It, it's, uh, I, I have some skin in this game because I, I run a self-catering uh, holiday property up in the north coast in Portrush. And... Uh, and I've yet to find out whether we're covered. It seems that we're not. Uh, I think the, the difficulty is when you're not uh, business rated. Uh, uh, so, for instance, a self-catering property wouldn't be business rated and self uh, bed and breakfast, I'm not sure, but it may not be. Uh, but they should uh, make contact with their local council to check because it's the local councils that are, are, are running this. So check with their local council uh, and see if there is any support available to them because other businesses in hospitality are getting grants uh, of £25,000, which is obviously a, a massive boost if you're looking potentially at the, the complete loss of business over the next few months. We'll keep asking questions and getting answers, Adrian Houston, for now. Thank you. And if you have a question, 030 30 80 55 55, text 81771, email oyb at bbc.co.uk. We have a lot more coming up, I can tell you. Definitely talking about EasyJet, I can tell you that. And if you can't get a refund, Jimmy Hughes has an idea. And you should actually go back to the old-fashioned way of taking an ordinary envelope and putting a nice big clean letter setting out the details of your booking, how you paid it, where it was and everything else. 
You see, there's a novel idea. Jimmy always goes back to basics, doesn't he? If you can't email, just send a letter, put a stamp on it and post it. It's 10 o'clock. On 92 to 95 FM and 1341 medium wave, this is BBC Radio Ulster. And with the BBC News, I'm Naomi Holland. One of the government's most senior advisers on the coronavirus pandemic, Professor Neil Ferguson, has urged people not to flout the lockdown restrictions to enjoy the sunny weather this weekend. He said if they did, it could mean that the UK suffered high rates of infection for weeks and weeks, rather than the rapid decline seen in China. The Chief Constable of Devon and Cornwall, Sean Sawyer, has also urged the public not to flock to the beaches and countryside. Devon and Cornwall Police requires the public, both within and with outside our geography, to play their part. And where they do gather, then we'd come to there, we will talk, we'll converse, and if needs be, as a last resort, we'll enforce. But if a £60 ticket makes you do something, and 684 people dying yesterday didn't, then I think you've got to take a good look at yourself as to whether you realise the seriousness and significance of where we are. The PSNI are also warning members of the public to observe the regulations in place and stay at home. Assistant Chief Constable Alan Todd said although people were entitled to get some exercise every day, this did not extend to travelling for the purpose of exercise. The UK's leading body for scientists involved in medical testing has warned that global shortages of chemical reagents will make it difficult for the government to hit its target of carrying out 100,000 coronavirus tests a day. The Institute of Biological Science says the industry can't increase the numbers despite having the laboratory capacity and staffing levels needed. The chairman of the Health and Social Care Select Committee, Jeremy Hunt, says it's critical more tests are done. It's not the test in itself, it's what the test then allows you to do, to quarantine the person who has the virus and to track down the people that they've been in touch with, to test them, to see who they've been in touch with, to quarantine them. And that approach we can now see is by far the most effective at suppressing the virus. Ferry companies have warned that the pandemic will leave them with no option but to drastically reduce services within days, putting supplies of food and medical equipment at risk. It's estimated that up to half of the food the UK consumes is imported. The UK Chamber of Shipping's Chief Executive Bob Sanguinetti is calling on the government to provide financial assistance. We have a number of companies explaining how much money they're losing and we're talking millions every day. And what we're asking for is not a wholesale bailout. It is the government to share and underwrite some of the risk and the costs to allow the ferry companies to continue providing that vital lifeline service to the country. Gardaí are investigating the theft of two cash machines and overnight raids from banks in Dundalk. Two vehicles were set alight at Dundalk Garda station to hinder police response to the incidents. Gardaí say those involved were intercepted by members of the armed support unit, but the raiders later crossed the border. Irish police say they are working closely with colleagues in the PSNI. Now with a look at the weather, here's Angie Phillips. Generally cloudy today with just odd brighter intervals. The odd spot of rain may break out here and there but most parts dry and with a noticeable southerly breeze temperatures should rise to 11 or 12 Celsius in most places. Staying mainly dry for this evening and tonight when the breeze continues to pick up. The cloud will break up to give some clearer spells but it'll stay quite mild and frost free. BBC News. And welcome back to On Your Behalf. I'm Linda McCauley. And in case you wondered what went on between 9 and 10, if you're confused, your usual listening, regular listening on Saturday, well, On Your Behalf has been extended to an hour because of the coronavirus situation. So Gardner's Corner was 9 till 9.30, and that's happening next week too. So uh, I'm sure you're listening to right the way through anyway, from Kim Lenehan through to your place and mine with Anne-Marie, and then Gardner's 9 o'clock and then On Your Behalf. So it's really just the usual people are here in slightly different timings, your regular our Saturday morning listener because you know people feel very attached to radio I think they, they, they feel connected to radio in the way they don't feel connected to television so I, I, I hope you realise that we are here for you literally or all your questions and answers whether it's about your rhododendron or, or, your, or your, your benefits we've all got answers and we're here as a friend to you here on BBC Radio Ulster and Radio Foil and I must just tell you it's the start of Holy Week obviously in the lead up to Easter and there are going to be some very special programmes From Darkness to Dawn is 
a journey through Holy Week in words and music. It starts tomorrow on Palm Sunday, running right through to Easter Saturday. The Reverend Cheryl Mayban and Jim Deeds each day will reflect on the last words of Jesus on the cross. The programmes are broadcast each evening, 11.45, quarter to midnight. The, the Reverend Cheryl Mayban will also present At the Foot of the Cross on Good Friday from a quarter to nine till nine. That's after Good Morning Ulster. That sounds like very special programming and at this particular time I'm sure that'll be very comforting to many people and from God to Mammon if you missed my first home Vinnie Hurrell's new television programme it started last Monday night and it was brilliant I really enjoyed it and let's face it we all are having more time at home now you might pick up a few interior design tips they look at the, the very expensive houses and then and show you ways to do it in, in a cheaper way in your own home it's very entertaining too so it's Monday night uh, just after the 10 o'clock news and uh, 10.40 actually 10.40 uh, each episode they bring first time buyers to look at special homes and if you missed the first one of course it's still there on the iPlayer my experts are still here too if you need help in any shape or form oh, 30 30 80 55 55 text 81771 Adrian Houston still with me if you've got a question about uh, furloughs and self-employed and employed and all the other things the government have launched and we'll be talking about COVID-19 scams because there are a lot of them like the virus uh, around at the moment there's one particularly nasty one offering a voucher for a supermarket do not click on that and get in touch if you have a question for Tony Neat of Get Safe Online and indeed for Richard Williams, Head of Transport Policy at the Consumer Council. Morning to you, Richard. Morning, Linda. How are you? You're at home, obviously. I'm at home, <laughs> and... yes, I am indeed. That, well, the sunshine it... is in my window, so it could be worse. <laughs> Good. Well, listen, the, the question on anybody's lips, and they, they're all coming in by email and text this morning. If your flight's cancelled, what are you entitled to and how do you make the claim? As some airlines, and EasyJet seems to be the, the, the current one that people are complaining about, won't let you do it online. So what is happening? I think the first thing I need to state that the rules have changed. Uh, uh, the rules have stayed the same. The rules are, are rules as they have been. But the context of what we're operating in at the moment and the airlines is operating in, is very different because of COVID-19. So I'll tell you what the rules are and what you're entitled to, then we'll go on to the difficulties that people are obviously having and what we'll try and do about them. The first okay. thing is, OK, so with, if, you, if, you're, if, if the airline cancels the flight, then uh, under EU Regulation 261, you are entitled to a refund or an alternative flight. They must give you the option. Um, the, the law is as simple as that. Um, but... What's happening is we've seen a, a number of airlines, um, EasyJet is only one of them, um, are obviously having huge difficulty in making these payments and in, in, in paying the refunds. They've got cash flow problems. And in practical terms, they are just making things more and more awkward for people to actually obtain these refunds. So as you've quite rightly said, EasyJet are the ones who are really in the firing site at the moment for us because they operate so many flights out of Northern Ireland. And we had a record number of um, complaints this this week about EasyJet. What they're doing is, um, I mean, really they are flouting the law, the regulation here, because they are sending emails out which are stating to people that your flight has been cancelled, but they are not offering them the option of a refund. And if you go to the EasyJet website, you'll see they're also, um, when they're talking about cancellations, they are not offering the refund. So that that is completely wrong. They, they do have to have to offer that option. Um, well, I, I wonder, making, Richard, if it, I wonder, Richard, if the pressure of coming from the Consumer Council and indeed from on your behalf and other consumer bodies and the CAA, who we asked uh, what they were doing about it, and I know you have as well, uh, and we didn't get a very positive response from them at all. But I got an email last night. Now, I'm on an e EasyJet mailing list. I don't actually have a flight. But it said, Dear Linda, for a start, a message from Johan. And it actually says, to my surprise, uh, it says, uh, I know this has been a difficult and frustrating frustrating time for many of you, etc., etc., all that kind of stuff. But they're basically saying uh, our customer service team will be in touch to let you know how to switch to a new flight, get a voucher or be reimbursed. Now, that really pleased me. It says we're currently dealing with an unprecedented number of calls and are working hard, etc., etc. So is that new? Well, I haven't seen that one. The, the, the email which I saw uh, sent out this week didn't mention the reimbursement. Um, well, that, I know, and I got that last that's night. So that's, did, that's a change, yeah. So I'm awfully pleased to see that. So I think a bit of, something must have happened, a bit of pressure somewhere. So they're saying they'll be in touch with you. What, what should people do, though, at the moment? Do you think you should still write, phone, text, email, what? Um, 
I think you need to try and... Well, what they'll offer you is they'll offer you an option of an alternative flight or a voucher. Um, you need to make a decision about whether you want that or not, but we would suggest that um, you don't really need to make a decision immediately because you actually have 12 months to uh, pursue the refund. Um, and so you, you can sort of wait for that because obviously... You, you would go through the, new, the normal the normal routes. You would go onto the website, and if you can use the website, because if the, if the system, the option is there to actually email them, use that. You can ring them, but people are just not getting through. Um, you can, you, well, you could write to them, but essentially you'd go through the normal route, but it, it, it's getting so hard to get through that it may be best to just wait and see, um, you know, if this sort of the rush does die down a bit, because you do have that period to actually claim for that refund. The but you've got to hope you've got you've got to hope they're still in business, though, haven't you? Otherwise, you know, the, the, there'll be no coming. money there. Yeah. <laughs> and that is a really worst case scenario. And in normal circumstances, you wouldn't even mention that. But with what we're seeing um, is going on yes. the airlines, yeah, I suppose it has to be at the back of your mind. Um, it and does. the problem, of course, with with the uh, in the airline situation, unlike the package holidays that have got the uh, the ATOL and the ABTA protection behind them. As we saw with Flybe when it went to the wall, um, if an airline goes bust, anything you've got with them, whether it's a voucher, uh, a, a flight ticket booked for six months' time, um, you're not going to get it. It's, 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 it's going to go. Yes, it, it's, it's a difficult time for everyone and people are anxious about money, anxious about the bills uh, and if they think that they're owed money, they would like it back rather than another flight when you know, nobody's any, nobody can go anywhere. Jimmy Hughes always has a good answer for these kinds of things and when I was talking to him earlier in the week, I asked him to go online to the EasyJet site and see if he could find a way to get a refund online and this is what he found. They show you how to get a a credit note for a flight from a different destination or a different time in the future and stuff like that. And all those are fascinating things. Uh, when I walked in to buy a flight, I put money across the counter. I wanted to go somewhere. It was my choice. I handed the money across. My choice has fallen apart. I can't get it. I'd like my money back. So uh, it does seem that the site that they give you to contact them on, it doesn't have any... Uh, shall we say, press button or whatever you want to call it for getting a refund. And if you're starting to look and say, well, one thing's transferred, you're just giving away what you're entitled to. I was sort of thinking, yes, well, and it suddenly dawns on me, if email isn't working, Royal Mail is working. <laughs> and you can then for a right to them, ex expressing exactly what it is that you are looking for, the flight and everything else, and send it off to them there where they're based in Luton Airport. And you should actually go back to the old-fashioned way of taking an ordinary envelope and putting a nice wee clean letter setting out the details of your booking, how you paid it, where it was, and everything else. Uh, it's going to take a while. You're going to have to take copies. I would suggest that you be prepared to make a fight out of it. It's always good to hear Jimmy's view on things, isn't it? Richard uh, Williams of the Consumer Council is on the line. It's not just flights, although that we're hearing most about, but a lot of people asking me about the ferries. And this morning I got an email asking about Eurostar. Yeah, I, the, the, yes, the situation with the ferries is, um, again, I mean, the golden rule around all of these is, is that you don't cancel, that um, you, you wait for the company to cancel. And this is the same with the ferries. Now, we've been keeping an eye on the ferries that go out of uh, Northern Ireland, P&O, and Stena Line. Um, they, are on their website, um, they've been telling, saying that their service is exactly the same, that they've no, made no amendments to it. Um, in which case, um, if you don't want to travel, because, you know, for very good reasons at the moment, um, unfortunately, they're not going to be offering you a refund, um, and they don't have to. Um, what they have said, though, and both Stena and P&O are saying this, that if you do want to change um, your crossing um, because you don't want to travel at the moment, they will waive the, the amendment fee that the, they would the, the charge the for the that. The thing is, Richard, it's not that you don't want to travel. The government says you can't travel. So maybe the yeah. government needs to tell the ferries and Eurostar yeah. and, and all the other airline industry what they have to do. And this is a real issue here because people obviously are saying that. Um, what the regulation, this is another EU regulation, 1177 this time, and that's basically, it, if you cancel, you lose your rights, and it doesn't matter, unfortunately, that there is government restrictions being placed on your travel, so you can't take that ferry, that ferry journey. Um, that, as far as the ferry is concerned, until if they're still travelling, they haven't cancelled. This cancelling bit is tricky, isn't it? Um, 
We'll see how this EasyJet pans out now. I don't know who else got that email. Maybe it was only me. Maybe it was just Johan saying, Ooh. dear Linda, but somehow I doubt it. I think it was a, a, a yeah. generated email because I'm on a mailing list of some sort. But thank you, Richard, for that. And of course, if you go to the Consumer Council, you will take up uh, a, a, a complaint, a, a claim like this on behalf of the listeners, won't you? I was going to say that. I mean, we've actually got, I think it is almost 50 what we call stage two complaints in with EasyJet this week, which means that all of these people who are not getting their refunds have tried. We're putting them through to EasyJet and we have already got some results. These ones that were a couple of weeks ago. So it is worth contacting the Consumer Council. 0300 123 6262. All, of course, the phone numbers and websites and everything that we give out in the programme. The phone and operators have them if you want to ring in and also they're up on the website because there, there really are too many to, for me to give out and too quick for you to take them down as well. Richard Williams of the Consumer Council, thank you and, and keep in touch with us about the EasyJet thing, please. Now, You'd wonder, wouldn't you, uh, when the, people are trying to do their best and trying to pay their bills and, and trying to stay safe and save the, the national health and all the rest of it, you'd wonder what these scamming people are doing, trying to scam us out of our money at a time like this. Well, Tony Neat from Get Safe Online is with me. Tony, good morning. You're talking to me from Cardiff, isn't that right? I am from a, a sunny but a very quiet Cardiff, uh, Linda. Um, so hello from Wales. Lovely to have you with us. Tony, we were talking to Richard there about flight refunds, and that's just one of the many, many scams they're doing the round, saying, click here for a flight refund. Do not. Absolutely. Uh, and, Linda, it's very, very disappointing that we've seen more fraud taking place around coronavirus than anything else we've ever seen. In fact, it's estimated that we are the world leaders in relation to coronavirus-related e-spam and e-fraud. 20% of the global malicious coronavirus spam is sent to UK-based emails. Um, and, and, and when you look at France being 11% and the US being 8%, we really are leading the field on that, which is absolutely disgraceful. So they're picking on us, basically. So it's up to us to protect ourselves. Now, I heard last night about this one about a voucher that many people are getting, saying, it, here's this from the government for you to spend in your local supermarket. But that's the kind of thing. It's all marked coronavirus, isn't it? And people do click on things. You know, here's a refund on your flight. Here's a tax rebate because the government's been good to you. People are, are inclined to jump too quickly. Yes, they are. And, and we've got to think about it. And we are in, a, in an age where there are some really unscrupulous, uh, disgusting people around that are looking to make a profit on this. And, and on the Get Safe Online website, there's a whole list, um, far too many for me to go through individually with you today, Linda. But there's a huge list of, of, of what's there and what to do to safeguard yourself. But I, but I have a few um, and, a, and a couple that I wanted to mention to you. Fraudsters claiming to be from the Red Cross um, and organising shopping for elderly people. You That's put nasty. your money in and then you just lose your money. Other people who are just getting the goods, but they're putting extra goods on it for themselves. Absolutely disgraceful. Emails and texts claiming um, th that they're from the National Health Service, collecting money to develop a vaccine. Absolutely fraudulent. Um, things, you know, one of the things that I think is disgusting, texts are doing the rounds claiming to be from the HMRC, offering NHS workers tax refunds. Um, now, I, I've, got, I've got my wife and my two daughters are nurses. I want to safeguard them. I want to look after them. My, my one daughter, who's an A&E sister, has just gone down with COVID. I want to make sure that our NHS are protected and these scammers are there. So if you see them, um, make sure you don't click on them. Don't pass them on um, because these people are just fraudsters and they're, they're the low life of the world. There's no two ways about it. So there's all kinds of things. I certainly am getting a lot of emails offering to sell me masks and gels from, from China. I, I, I put them in. I actually block the sender. That's what I do. I hope that's the right thing to do, Tony. But there's fake counterfeit goods online. There's all kinds of offers of, of special money, money especially from the coronavirus problems that, that's available to you. And there's also malware. Is that the right word? Stuff that can get into your computer if you click on it, like false coronavirus maps. 
Absolutely. And, and one of the things we've seen is that um, any website that has got coronavirus or co COVID in the domain name, that's the title name of the website that you're going to, more than likely, um, we, we think they're fraudulent. Over 50% are definitely fraudulent. And they're just looking to scam you in whatever way you can. And what I would say to the listeners, uh, don't just listen to the, the stories that you and I are talking about, Linda. Really widen your thought about anything that you see that comes through, which, you know, Linda, we've said it numerous times, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Don't click on it. Don't click on maps. We know one of the maps from one of the university that I signed up to and what I'm looking at, but if you get it from a third person, it could have uh, embedded code which can affect your computer. So just be aware of it. But, do you know, Linda, I want to say one thing. Uh, I say all these bad things. The internet is a fantastic place. Where would we be today with this COVID virus going on without social media, without the interaction of the internet? Um, millions of interactions and transactions are successfully conducted. Let's not take it away from the internet. There are bad people out there and bad things. But overall, it's a fantastic place to be. You are right. There's so much uh, good stuff being shared. But could I just ask you about a couple of texts I've had this week, and I've had them from very many people, so they're obviously going around. There doesn't seem to be anything to click on, but it's telling you to look out for something like a special phone number that you shouldn't click on or, or, or a special email, cuckoo, I think it was. There are things saying, please forward to all your friends. What are they about? Well, we don't know. Uh, they could be genuine. They could be fraudulent. But there's enough warnings about out there for you not to pass on things that you are not 100% definite about. Now, when I, um, when I went specifically to a website that I knew was genuine, it was a university website, I picked up um, the app there and I sent it to the rest of my team. I knew it was genuine. My team knew that I wouldn't be passing on something like that. But even those asked me, Tony, are you sure that this is genuine? And you've got to, you've got to make sure it is. Don't necessarily assume it's going to be. Some of them are going to be good, which is a dreadful thing because the good ones are then ruined because of the bad ones and we're all suspicious. Fair enough. So a lot of information on Get Safe Online, and that's a very good place to go. Uh, the, the link's up on, on our website. Uh, Tony, stay safe, as everybody's saying, and just don't click. Think before you click. What will be your, your, your watchword for people on the internet? Absolutely. Don't share anything you're not 100% positive of and be suspicious of everything. Be suspicious. Is it awful when you have to say that? Awful when you have to say that. But, Tony, thanks for that. Be careful when you click and uh, think before you click. Probably is a good way Thank to Thank you, Linda. It. Look after thanks. yourself and, uh, and all your listeners. Indeed, and indeed the same to you, Tony. Thanks very much. So be careful, please, what you're... As I used to say in that cop show, be careful out there. Be careful at home on what you're clicking on. Uh, just going back quickly to Richard Williams of the Consumer Council. Richard, I think we maybe didn't quite make it clear enough about what to do if you've got a ferry ticket. Could you just clarify that for me? Because the ferries are going. Yes, um, if you have a ferry ticket, if you want to cancel it, then um, you're not going to get a refund. But what you can do is contact the ferry company and uh, change the, the time that you travel, and they're going to waive the fee to do that. Um, if they are amending their schedule, and we have heard that they may be amending their schedule um, this weekend, then you should contact them and find out if your actual scheduled uh, departure time is correct. Um, because if it isn't, and if they put it back by over 90 minutes, then you are entitled to a full refund. And they ha then you can apply for a full refund, which they must pay within seven days, which may get us back to the EasyJet situation, but that is your right. So check if, that, if your actual departure is going on time. But if you don't want to go, and indeed you can't go because the government says you, you, you can't leave your home or you can't travel at more than so many miles, you, you don't have a right to a refund. You don't have a right to a refund, not if you cancel. Um, you can uh, try and get that rescheduled at a different time. And as I say, they, they, they've said they're going to waive the fee in order for you to do that.
Well, thank you for clarifying that for us, Richard. And thank you all the people who've emailed in to oyb at bbc.co.uk to say they got the same text from Johan, dear Linda, dear whoever you are. So it, was, it wasn't just me. Uh, 030 30 80 55 55 is a number. Somebody's emailing to say he can't get through. 030 30 80 55 55. Yes, Richard. Sorry, I just wanted to correct the actual telephone number because I think the number you've given out is the consumer line number. I'm not sure if that's operating at the moment. The okay, what number? number what's, the, what's the best number 0800, for you? Okay, it's 0800 121 6022. Okay, 0800 121 2 6022. We'll make sure that's the right number as well. I'm not sure consumer line is, is working as well. I must check that out actually. So we do give it out to a lot of people. Richard, thank you very much for that. Uh, Adrian Houston, our tax, tax expert, is still with us. Adrian, welcome back again. A lot of questions coming in that are very specific and worrying people a lot. Uh, for example, uh, Linda, self-employed people might be able to get up to £2,500 per month from the government. The Chancellor used the term up to £50,000 business profits a year to qualify. Is that gross profit or net profit? Profit. Uh, Colm's asking that, Adrian. It, it's, your, it's your taxable profit. So it, it's the profit that ultimately you paid tax on in your uh, tax returns that were filed. So it'll be after all of your usual business expenses and the capital allowances that you claim on cars or equipment you use in your business. So it's the figure that ends up appearing on your tax calculation uh, as the amount of which you pay tax in national insurance. OK. Uh, Jim says, we have an employee who's getting statutory sick pay about five months. If he's on statutory sick pay, can we furlough him and pay 80% of his regular wages? Yes, I, 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 I believe you can. I don't think there's any difficulty there. The key thing is, is that they have to be an employee at the 28th of March, and this person is. Uh, so, yes, they can be furloughed. That's good news. And generally, wh where do you, where's the best place to get information on all of this? What's the best website to go to? Uh, I would always go to always look for something that says .gov.uk. Yes. Um, so there is, there is one one exception to that, which is NI Business Info. All the localised support and links to the national ones are on nibusinessinfo.co.uk. NI Business Info, all one big word. .co.uk. So that's the exception to the, my usual rule, which is stick to .gov.uk. Uh, and Thanks, there's a lot there. You did ask me earlier about bed and breakfast, and in the NI Business Info, it says that uh, there will be uh, further information about hospitality sectors will be published as soon as it's available. So we still don't know exactly what they're going to cover. So fingers crossed for the B&Bs and the self-catering. Thank you for that, Adrian. And as things change, please keep in touch with the programme so we can uh, uh, get the information through to our listeners because uh, it's very much changing times, changing times, and you have to keep keep asking the questions and getting the answers as we go along. Adrian Houston, thank you for that. Uh, 030 30 80 55 55 is the number. And, of course, email oyb at bbc.co.uk. The shape of On Your Behalf is changing over the next few weeks as we concentrate on answering as many of your coronavirus questions as possible. That's why we've had an earlier starting time of 9.30. But we still always like to hear from Jimmy Hughes. And Jimmy's here to answer your questions any time you want to leave them on the listener line. Uh, of course, you can leave your numbers there and we will try and get in touch with you and see if we can answer your question at any time during the week. Just before we go, I just want to tell you about a, a different little thing that we're doing here in the programme because, you know, it's, it, it is sadness and anxiety surrounding the coronavirus, but there are some green shoots. We're hearing stories of hope and reports of neighbours looking out for each other, particularly for the elderly and the vulnerable. Lots of community groups and food banks have been doing more rather than less to help at this time. So for the next few weeks, we would like to shine a light 
on some of the good things as well. Now, if you know of a community group or a food bank or a church or a shop who are going above and beyond, let us know and we'll do a roundup each week. So to start us off, the Larder Food Bank on Mercy, Mercy Street in East Belfast has seen a massive upsurge in demand over the last few weeks. And they have told us a big thank you to all of you who have helped us to meet the rising demand for food parcels from the deliveries of food by individuals that's coming from Hovis, local spars, TK Maxx, churches and local businesses to cash to donations. Also offers of help to deliver food. Uh, also the expert in infectious diseases who made sure we were being safe and to our tireless team of volunteers who have been helping and volunteering and, and helping all our people in East Belfast. They say we're fortunate to have a compassionate, generous community who understands there is enough, enough when we all share. So thank you very much to them letting know what's know what's happening in East Belfast. And if you would like to let us know what's happening in your area, please get in touch and we will try and share a bit of good news on your behalf. That's it this week from my guests, James Jones, Phil McGarry, Tony Neat, Richard Williams. Thank you all for being with us. We're here all the time, 9033 Leave your name on the listener line and we'll try and get you an answer. We'll be live next week again at 9.30 till 10.30. Until then, from me, from the team, goodbye.